direction. And uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, Yoneda and Horiuchi uh, published in 1971, but uh, probably they uh, submitted this paper in 1970 uh, about the, the this famous paper on TXRF. So the TXRF was uh, uh, so it's uh, established by strong comments. So such kind of strong comments and discussion is very important for to find a new uh, experiments. I'd like to change my my topic to reciprocity theorem. And Horiuchi always said when he discussed uh, TXRF. So this is the uh, grazing incidence X-rays, but not uh, reflected. And this is the critical angle of total reflection. And this is uh, uh, the total reflection. So Horiuchi always said this is uh, not correct because of the, the reciprocity theorem. And uh, we must always uh, uh, think about the reciprocity theorem. And this is the results of the reciprocity theorem. So X-ray is coming to, to, to penetrate the, the, the solid and the, the angle becomes shallower. And at some point, the the reflection starting and at much shallower angle, the reflection is stronger than the penetration. And finally, uh, all the X-rays are totally reflected. So this is uh, the true uh, or real uh, phenomena, but we uh, always think just like this. So both are uh, only the model, and we must think about the uh, which one is uh, uh, important for some to explain some kind of uh, experimental results. I'd like to uh, show one other final uh, final point. So that the similarity between X-ray diffraction and the TXRF. So this is the, the, it's a Darwin curve of uh, X-ray diffraction. So this is a silicon 111 single crystal, big crystal, and this is the black angle. And uh, this is uh, the silk hat, uh, silk hat uh, profile without X-ray absorption. And this is, uh, with uh, X-ray absorption. So if we use dynamical theory of X-ray diffraction, the, the diffraction peak has uh, some width. And if the absorption is uh, existing, then uh, this kind of line shape is uh, uh, calculated, completely theoretically calculated using the dynamical theory of X-ray diffraction. And Takahashi and Nakatani uh, published a paper in 1995 that this line shape is quite similar to the total reflection uh, of X-rays. So this is the total reflection and this is uh, the weaker and uh, its uh, X-ray is penetrating into the surface. But the this is the critical angle and this is uh, angle zero. And this is the critical angle, and this is twice the critical angle. So the difference is the scaling of the, the angle, the black angle and uh, the incident angle. So I'd like to uh, conclude my, my talk. So TXRF was found due to four strong comments and five years of hard experiments by uh, Yoneda and Horiuchi. And reciprocity theorem is a good guideline to understand the TXRF experiments. And the similarity between the dynamical theory of X-ray diffraction and uh, total reflection will give you some instinct, instinct, some, some error here. So uh, I published uh, a book 
from Springer uh, the end of last year, and I uh, wrote uh, these topics. Uh, it's not scientific, only uh, some kind of story I heard from Yoneda and Hori, not, not Yoneda, it's directly from Horiuchi. And uh, the second one is also from Horiuchi, and the third one is from uh, Takahashi and uh, Nakatan. So uh, such kind of story uh, was written in or written in in my book. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, and I'd like to stop. Thank thank you so thank much, you. Yun, for these uh, insights to the very beginning, or still, which uh, we we all should. Uh, keep in mind when, when we use TX or S um, to the beginning of the physics of uh, TX or F. Are there comments, uh, questions for Yoon? Uh, Ma'am, uh, very good afternoon. Myself, Dr. Sandeep Oja. May I raise a question? Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, my question is with uh, Jun, sir. Uh, actually, uh, you have to say in about uh, X, uh, X ray and T X ray. So, the uh, difference between it will characterize by many uh, different number of pathway or uh, some type of characteristics should be fully differ with each other. Or the criteria of any X rays related to uh, either in any body part, we can elaborate in the form of TX ray. So which one is too much uh, younger one? I think TX ray is too much better than X ray. May I write or wrong, sir? Uh, I, I, I cannot understand. Uh, would you someone uh, uh, explain the question of uh, Sandeep? Yeah, sir, uh, Dr. Think, Sandeep Oja. Yeah. From yeah. Gorakhpur, UP, India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you please oh. repeat the question? By, by um, I, I ask Nandurar to 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 repeat, mm -hmm. <laughs> explain <laughs> this, this, this uh, question. I'm sorry. You you can discuss it with him in detail, Sandeep, by uh, email. Through email. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, I will ask uh, with email, sir. Okay, uh, okay. sir. Uh, in linear way, uh, what is the major difference between XRA and X-ray and uh, T-X-ray? Ah, uh, yeah, the, it's a, this one. Uh, uh, the basic question. Sado topic. Sado topic. Sir. Sir. Yes. Uh, if you so th this is a very difficult paper, and if you read the the paper of Nakatani and Takahashi in nineteen ninety five, in published in Surface Science, we, you understand the details, and okay. if you understand the details of their, their uh, theory, uh, it is sometimes very useful for, for understand the total reflection or reflectivity. So at first, I, I omit the details of their theory. So, so I would appreciate it if you uh, read, uh, at first you find their paper and read uh, their papers. Definitely, sir. I will read. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the question. And are there more questions? I don't see any more questions. And thank you, Yoon, again. Ah, thank and you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, now we come to our second speaker for today. And that is uh, Nantla Mishra. Do you have slides that you like to share with us? Hello. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay. Do you have slides that you are going to share? Yes, yes, I, I have slides. Uh, yes, are you able to see the slides? Yes, also in the PowerPoint mode. Do you want to go yes, ahead yes. with that? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going that uh, slide. So, okay. Okay, yes. So, should now I... it's a presentation mode. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Should I start? Yes, please. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, to presenting today. And uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sula. And uh, the title of my talk is TXRF Analysis. Advantages, Applications, Limitations, and Future Perspectives. And uh, in this slides, just I will come directly to the TXRF. In TXRF, what are the advantages? And if you see, the first advantage is we have very small amount of sample on a totally reflecting surface. And because of this advantage, TXRF finds application in those area where sample availability is less, like forensic, medical applications, radioactive samples. And again, the X-ray fall at an angle less than the critical angle. So, so, and after falling on the sample surface and reflector, they get totally reflected. So they don't penetrate deep inside because of which background scattering is less and background is less. Again, when this angle is very, very small, point around 0.1 to 1 degree, then, and this reflected beam also goes at same angle, 0.1 to 1 degree, the detector can come very close to the sample. Again, the X-ray beam, incoming X-ray beam excites the sample and totally reflected beam excites the sample. So all these features, reduce the detection limit or make the detection limit better. So because of these advantages, the total reflection X-ray fluorescence analysis have been applied to those areas also where normal conventional trace elemental analysis techniques do not find much application. So I will give some example of those areas and try to explain how we can make TXRF a technique which can be used in more better way and by the more laboratories. So coming, just I have tried to summarize the TXRF advantages and in this slide, just I have tried to show that uh, what are the advantages of TXRF compared to other conventional techniques like ICPAES or ICP mass spectrometry? The techniques written in red are normal, means these are applicable to all types of techniques, whereas in green, uh, they are those techniques, uh, those advantages which are present in TXRF only compared to it is simple, fast, multi-elemental analytical techniques. All elements with uh, atomic number 13 and below can be analyzed using the normal excitation and ambient air, air atmosphere sample chamber, whereas elements from carbon to aluminum can be analyzed with vacuum chamber and low atomic number is X-ray tubes like chromium, scandium, aluminium. A variety of samples in different matrices can be analyzed with dynamic range. This is economical. It has automated operations. Simple sample preparation is there. Sample in some cases, I will try to show that almost no sample preparation is required. And quantification is easy. Single internal standard can be used. Lesser analytical waste. This is very much useful for radioactive samples. Metals and non-metals can be analyzed alike. And if you see the spectra, less, less interference in spectra, matrix and memory effects are absent. A small amount of sample is required. It is non-destructive in nature or sometimes non-conjunctive in nature. Solid samples can be analyzed directly as slurry. Depth profiling is possible using GIXRF mode. Elemental speciation direct we can do or by sorbing the particular species in a membrane. So because of these applications, it finds application in various 
industry, various uh, application areas are there. Industry, thin layer materials, it can be used, and semiconductor wafers, metals, nuclear materials, some new type of application I will show. Minerals, oils, chemical CTC, environmental analysis, water sample analysis, soil, air, aerosol, dust. In health, for human health, it can be used as drinking water, food, medicine. In agriculture, for analysis of fertilizer, soil and management, milk analysis, medical and clinical applications, blood, blood serum, organ tissue, hair and dental plaque can be analyzed. Similarly, it finds application in art and archaeology, heritage, forensic areas it has been used for old paintings, architectures, gun shots, currency notes, etc. and nuclear and toxic materials. So now I will give exam some example of those applications which are possible with TXRF, but uh, either not possible with other conventional techniques or possible with very difficulty. So first application is that uh, we can use it when we don't want to dissolve the sample or dissolution of the sample is difficult. One is area of application where we have applied is the environmental disposal of fly ash. Fly ash is nothing but finely divided leftover residues obtained after the combustion of coal. In uh, this uh, thermal power plants using coal and aluminum producing plants, there also coal is used for burning. And we find that several million tons of fly ash is produced and it is a big problem how to dispose it. See, this is just I have tried to show a power plant and here how the heap of fly ash is there and here are some uh, expanded images there. Now, the, if we come to the composition of the fly ash, it has silica, it has aluminum oxides, iron and calcium oxide, traces of elements like arsenic, beryllium, boron, cadmium, chromium, cobalt, lead, magnesium, mercury, molybdenum, there is some uranium and thorium also. And <coughs> composition varies with different type of coals and different type of plants. And the area where fly ash application is being done for production of brick, tiles, blocks, mines, and mines back filling for making roads, for concrete making, cement making, reclamation of low-lying areas, soil mixing for agriculture. It can be mixed with soil so that it can be used for agriculture. However, for all these applications, the composition of the fly ash should be known. And if, for example, these elements like uh, uranium, thorium, or chromium, they are in high amount, that one have to, will have to think that they should not go in higher amount in the those uh, application materials. And if you want to analyze it by mass spectrometry or the ICPAS, one I will have to dissolve it. And this dissolution is very, very difficult. It requires hydrofluoric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. And during this dissolution, what happens that it may introduce some impurity. And because of that, the <coughs> composition may be incorrect also. And then some elements are present in so much low amount that we have seen that suppose you want to analyze by ICPMS, that already that much blank is there in that, uh, this, uh, that uh, sample uh, analyzer. So, so you cannot analyze because of the memory effect. So what we tried that we have got one problem that uh, we some fly ash samples came from an aluminum plant and we have to analyze it. So just we made this fly ash um, thin, very fine powder by grinding and just applied some powder on the TXRF sample support, recorded its spectra and we could find this type of spectra. You can see the elements like potassium, calcium, silicon also was there in large amount. Then with a small peak of aluminum, you can see, then barium, chromium, iron, zinc, all these elements were present. 
and then question their main concern was on thorium and uranium however thorium and uranium lines were so weak that it was not uh, we how to say that with confirmity that they are present then what we did that we recorded the we made the slurry in water and recorded the txrp spectra using an internal standard and uh, <clears throat> just uh, i would like to go to this mode and uh, if you see when we are giving uranium and thorium we are selecting uranium and thorium the fitting is very nice but when we selected did not select uranium and thorium here you can see there is some difference and here also there was some difference so like that we analyze that uh, all the samples and <clears throat> and this is analysis results were very much helpful in disposing this uh, flyers so this was one application where dissolution was not required and here also coming to the nuclear application that uh, if you see that uh, nuclear fuel nuclear fuel is uh, produced in form of pellets and these pellets then they are put in that uh, cladding materials before putting these in cladding materials we should know what is its composition and these are centered pellets of uranium and thorium oxide it is very difficult to dissolve again these pellets also normally that uh, by amperometry they are in live after dissolving so what we thought that we can transfer a very small amount of sample if we rub it on the xrf sample support and to our surprise once we rub they just they are very very hard material and just we touch the sample support regard the txrf spectra we got very good spectra so by recording that txrf spectra we analyzed uranium with respect to thorium and we could say that what is the composition of these pellets and we compared with by amperometry also the results were very in very much agreement and this work was later published in electrical chemistry similarly we another approach for analyzing the sample without dissolution we applied on zirconium niobium and their alloys what we did we cut in the form of the sample txrf sample shape and we polished it so that they are their roughness is similar as the txrf sample support and we analyzed it directly on the i a beam line of uh, synchrotron triester using two energy of excitation that what mean one was 14 kb so one was uh, 1.9 kb this 1.9 kb excitation was used for low atomic number elements and 14 kb for medium atomic number elements but aluminum was common here we analyzed that aluminum with this 14 kb and whatever value of aluminum we have got we assume that uh, aluminum as internal standard and and like that low atomic number meant to be this was another application now coming to the <clears throat> another application that analysis of plutonium based samples gun shots led to nuclear and forensic areas where sample amount available is very very small for plutonium sample analysis sample available is not to, um, that is small we can take milligram or uh, gram of sample however plutonium is radio toxic and it is very costly also so and another thing that nuclear waste should be minimum another problem with analysis of plutonium is that for handling plutonium one has to handle it in glow box so some people may not be knowing what is the glow box just i tried to see this is steel box is like this but these panels are glass of glass and they there are new print globe fitting here and this is the port for taking sample inside a double door one opens out and this door opens from inside and then another for taking out the material there is another port here they has only one door it opens from inside there is pvc bag so once we have to take the sample first you have to close all the doors then open this door only put the sample inside carefully close it 
and then open it from inside, take in inside. And this glue box always remains in negative pressure. That air is sucked from outside to inside. In case there is some leakage or there is puncture in this uh, new print glue, then air should from outside it should go inside. Air should not get contaminated. This I have tried to show that how it is sealed. That material is taken out, then it is sealed by sealing machine, and then it is cut from in between so that one part is that side, one part is this side. So this is double model glow box. Here, why I wanted to show it that for ICPAS, ICMS, or any other technique analyzing protonium, you have to keep the sample inside. And once you keep the sample inside, operation and maintenance of the sample and analysis becomes very, very slow. The work which you can do in one hour takes one day. <clears throat> and again, there, why it becomes so? Because you have to follow the safety norm. You have to be a lab port, PLD badges, lead ports in case of high radiation dose. Follow the limit of handling of different forms, solid liquid powder guidelines in terms of critical mass. Proper isolation is required. Always working with a company and you cannot work alone. Somebody should be present. Working with any instrument in glow box is very slow process, I already told. Then one silver lining of this is that some amount of plutonium can be handled in open air with some conditions. That what is that condition? A small amount of plutonium with active heat of 1000 becquerel. 1000 becquerel, if you consider plutonium 239, it will come to 430 nanogram. And this much amount of sample is sufficient for the and, uh, analysis by TXR. So we thought that let us apply this silver lining of plutonium handling for analysis of plutonium without putting the instrument inside the glue box. What we did, we took two microliter of sample on the TXRF sample support, dried it, and then covered it with collodion. Collodion is an organic liquid. We put on that it and it dries fast, make a very thin film over this plutonium. And then we wiped it with a tissue paper that those areas where plutonium and this uh, sample is not there. And these operations were done in the fume. And after that, it was transferred. It was checked for any loose activity. And then its spectra was recorded in ambient air. And to our surprise, with two microliter of the sample, you can see with uh, 16 microgram per ml plutonium, 60 ppm plutonium, we got very good spectra. You can see plutonium lines are there. <clears throat> then we have put two internal standard gallium and yttrium. On the basis of both the uh, gallium and uh, yttrium, we analyzed the samples and compared the results with uh, this uh, TXRF using gallium and sample the expected concentration. And TXR had determined that in, in uh, ATM internal standard, these results were very, very matching. And we compared the result with bi metry also. There also the agreement was very, very good. So this was a very good application. Again, it was published in the JAS in 2019. And after getting confidence with that, we applied this with trace element analysis of plutonium. Here, what we did, we took very small amount of sample, 500 microliter round, and put a extractant in this one, plutonium solution. One is blank, one is sample, and then saved it very well. And then at first phase, we separated it. 30% TBP in dodecane was taken as a extractant. And <clears throat> when we analyzed this, that trace elements will go to in that uh, aqueous phase. And when we analyzed it, then we found that first we did with uh, a simulated sample. We mixed uh, multi-element standard in plutonium. We got very good result. And then later we analyzed the real some real plutonium samples. And those results we 
compared with ICPAS, that results were very, very matching. And this was also a good application where a very small amount of sample is required and it made a life very easy for handling protonium in without blowouts. And there are some applications reported for biological and forensic sample, body fluid, tissue cells, gun shot tools. So some recent applications I would like to show here. Now question comes why a biological sample is analysis is required. Then one thing is the pollution control. Pollution control of water bodies supplying water, drinking water. And these are prone to contamination of toxic metals. And if you analyze the water samples, you will get the contamination level at that time. But the organisms living in that water take that uh, trace elements and store it for longer period. If you analyze the tissue samples of those organisms, it will give information on long-term basis for trace element and contamination of the water body. So here just I have tried to show that uh, what body parts can be analyzed for the getting information. If kidney stone can be analyzed, for getting information about kidney spore, normal and cancerous tissues can be analyzed <coughs> for knowing what elements may be responsible for cancer, then eye lens and aqueous humor can be analyzed, then scalp hair can be analyzed for knowing the a kind of uh, poison giving to that uh, body, either intentionally or by mistake, and then the gangivitis and oral fluids can be analyzed. And there are some papers which say that this type of analysis can give information that what type of disease is there in that person. Then blood and serum sample can be analyzed. Nails, that can be given various information. Urine can give this information. Then THRF can be applied for such type of analysis in a... <coughs> Painless manner, or if, so if you suck blood, blood you, you get pain, but if you analyze that uh, gangivitis fluid or oral fluid, then <clears throat> it can give information in a good manner. So some analysis, such type of analysis is reported in literature. Just I try to, <clears throat> one analysis is, just one minute. One analysis is, one report is that analysis of chromium and lead in <coughs> water body. It has been reported by Veltron BG et al. and published in Journal of Analytical Methods in Chemistry in 2009. Oh, sorry, 2019. <coughs> but what, what they did, they took the tissue samples of turtle shark, dolphin from water body. And they light it weighed amount, they took the weight amount, cleaned them, and then digested with gallium internal standard. And after analysis, they come came on the conclusion that chromium <coughs> they came on the conclusion that uh, Chromium and uh, lead can be analyzed in the tissue samples. And there in a paper, what I could come across of uh, Annie Marie Wagner uh, with uh, Dr. Johan Bowman. And here they have studied liver and muscle tissues of fish samples from polluted and non polluted water areas. And they could find that copper, zinc, arsenic, selenium, cadmium. Lead and chromium <coughs> were found more in liver samples <coughs> compared to the control sites. What they conclude that these elements don't go to other body parts of the face, but they go in the liver. And similarly, blood, saliva, and oral fluids, hair, nail, aqueous, and less, less humor samples, and aqueous humor of cataract patients are reported in literature. 
And then solid tissue samples can also be analyzed by directly preparing a thin maximum 15 micron section from the frozen sample by microtone after addition of an internal standard and drying the section placed onto the carrier. Then all these studies you can find in a recent book edited by Vivek Kumar Singh, Professor John Kawai, Rugesh Kumar Tripathi in X-ray fluorescence and biological sciences, principal instrumentation and applications. It has been published by John Villay and Sons in 2022. Another paper I could see on this about Norbert in, in Elka Kimka Acta. And then Raman Fernandez also has summarized this work in X-ray spectrometry of the year 2022. So these literature, if you want to see this type of uh, study, you can just record this. Another <coughs> application of TXRF, advantageous application, I will say, in forensic sample. Forensic sample, gun shot residues by TXRF can be analyzed and it is reported some uh, studies I found <coughs> that for Forensic evidences are one of the fundamental pillars of the crime investigation. In case of gun firing, discharge, what happens that that discharge comes on the back side of the shooter. And if this vibe is collected from the back, uh, um, back side of the hand, is digested and then analyzed, then this can give information whether that person has shot the bullet or not. And this type of one study has been done by Patricio Sarapura in applied and co-workers in applied radiation and isotopes, which was published in the year, year 2019. They have come on conclusion that TXRF, TXRF signals corresponding to K line of copper and L line of barium and lead have given discriminating variables and using machine learning algorithm, they would successfully determine the gun shot review from the back hand of the shooter and decision tree methodology presents a very high classification performance. Just a spectra, I would like to see it so that uh, you can see this is the non-shooter and that TXRF sample, and this is from the shooter. You can find out that iron is very high amount in the shooter, whereas in the non shooter, it is very, very less. Similarly, copper, zinc, and lead, both all the three elements are completely differentiable. Another experiment I had been what I came across was from Professor Strelitz group, Christina Strelitz group. And uh, it was published in International Center for Depression Data. But they have done some study in collaboration with Police Command of Vienna. However, they have come on the conclusion that differentiation is not feasible due to changing components. It's similar, but in different way, a study has been reported by A. Samantha Itel in Journal of Forensic Sciences in the year 2022. Here they have made the gun shots on a, an object which is made of cloth. And from that cloth, they have collected the gun shot samples and they could analyze lead, copper, barium, antimony, iron, and zinc. And on that basis, they have very nicely told the TXRF spectra could be used to suggest the category of ammunition. Six type ammunition they have used and they have clearly differentiated <coughs> the ammunition from this di uh, different uh, shooting objects. And another question arises that can we apply that this TXRF methodology for the analysis of nuclear forensic area samples. Lot of work is needed in collaboration with other techniques. Source can be, so that source can be identified. Here, I would like to say the TXRF has one weakness that it cannot analyze the isotopic composition. But same time, it has one advantage 
that it can be used for the speciation, which I will tell later. Similarly, the agriculture analysis of agriculture products and agriculture soils, fertilizers, this is also very an important area. And here a lot of samples are required to be analyzed and TXRF can serve this as a fast multi-elemental analytical technique. Then some reports are reported which I can come across. One is that G. Medina Gonzalez in just in the journal Sustainability in the year 2023 only it has been published. They, what they have done, they have done the rapid and convenient, convenient assessment of trace element contamination in agriculture soils. So slurry TXRF methods they have analyzed. What they have done, they have made this slurry they have digested the sample. On that digested sample, they have analyzed by GFAS and salary sample they have analyzed by TXRF. But this digested sample they have analyzed by both the techniques. 30 milligram of powder soil they have taken. It was taken with 1500 microliter of triton X as surfactants and 10 microliter of gallium internally standard they have added. And for digestion, they have used one gram of dry powder, soil in 25 milliliter of concentrated nitric acid. After homogenization, there are various steps they digested it. Net result is that when they have analyzed salary sample, digested sample by GFAS and TXRF, the results were very good, very well matching. Only problem was that in salary method, the, you can see this uh, precision is poor compared to the GFAS. So here, salary method, what they have concluded that salary method serves the purpose. However, I am of the opinion that uh, this precision should be improved somehow. Then another similar publication in agriculture area, which I can find is from Professor Marguerite's group. It is published in Food Chemistry. They have analyzed that TXRF, analyzed, used TXRF for the analysis of milk powder. What they have done, 40 milligram of powder sample was suspended in one ml of solution of 1% Tritron X100 mixed with internal standard. And they could analyze using internal standard, yttrium and gallium. So here you can see that chlorine, potassium, calcium, these type of elements, here also successfully they have applied this. Now, one, this was the story of analysis of trace element by TXRF. However, in TXRF, we can use it for speciation also. We should it is required to know the species present in a material also in addition to the trace elemental composition. How it can be done? It can, as I told that uh, we have made the TXRF sample, support, uh, TXRF sample just by rubbing the sample on the TXRF sample supports. In similar way, we can make the sample and then record the TXRF spectra using the different energy before the edge and after the edge in XOPS and JNS region. And then emission spectra are just thus obtained can be converted to adjacent spectra and the speciation and the structural study can be done using very small amount of sample. Such type of study may be useful for nuclear, forensic, archaeological, and biological sciences, especially where species are unstable. And <clears throat> these species are unstable in uranium oxide, for example. If you see, if you heat uranium oxide, it will get converted to different oxides, like U307, U409, U308. These are very unstable oxide. U308 is stable, but these are unstable. And what happens that if you treat the sample too much, 
this oxidation state may change. But here, what we are doing, we are just rubbing, not doing any sample preparation much. And then when we record the TXRF spectra at different energies, get the speci speciation information, that speciation information may be very useful with a small amount of sample. Here, just I have tried to show if you see U3, U8, and they see the charge balance, it may be mixture of uranium-6 and uranium-5, or another possibility is that it may be mixture of uranium-6 and uranium-4, the charge balance on the basis of charge balance. Similarly, U3, O7, it can be mixture of uranium-4 and uranium-6. Here, it can be, or it can be mixture of uranium-5 and uranium-4. Similarly, U409, it can be mixture of uranium 4 and 5 or mixture of 4 and 6. Now, how to know this? So, in order to see this, we made some study on our uh, Indus 2 synchrotron light source in the earth. And here, what we did, that we made the sample by rubbing just uh, on the TXRF sample support, very small amount of sample and then recorded the TXRF spectra and different energy. Here you can see that this is the direct beam, this is the totally reflected beam. And after measuring the spectra, we got very good spectra with so much small sample. And when we process this, and uh, we reached on the conclusion that U3O8 is mixture of uranium-6 and uranium-5, whereas u 3 o seven is mixture of uranium four and uranium six. And these studies are matching with earlier reported study. There are other methods of quantification uh, or speciation where the species can be solved in membrane deposited on the TXRF sample supports. What we, oh, here one in one of the studies in our group, what was done that uh, quad supports were functionalized by Einstein, three glycidyl loxy profile, trimethylhexane, and subsequently reacting with NMDG. And then gold nanoparticles were solved in that. After that, arsenic 5 solution was, uh, it was dipped in arsenic 5, and arsenic 5 was solved. And in SART, what I would like to say, after SART one, arsenic 5, this arsenic 5 was analyzed, and total arsenic was analyzed by oxidizing arsenic 3 to oxidizing 5 and analyzing in the same manner. And in this way, this is speciation of arsenic in uh, groundwater wise. And other studies reported in literature, similar studies are arsenic in cucumber by Australian group, Myra and its co workers. And uh, this is a setup of synchrotron radiation induced total reflection X ray fluorescence and X ray absorption near edge structure recently commissioned at BC, second beam line, Ursula group, in Journal of Synchrotron Radiation. So these are some studies on speciation. Now, these were the advantages of phase element analysis and uh, speciation on in TXRF. However, TXRF has certain limitations. These are some prerequisites and future perspectives also. These are general limitations, impossibility of totally non-destructive analysis. However, we I saw in some slides and some papers that how we could tackle it. And there are other reports also where non-destructive analysis has been done by TXRF. Then limitations for volatile samples. Samples, solids can be rubbed, and light from solution can be immobilized in membranes. Exception for low jet elements, in this direction, vacuum chamber, ultra thin window detectors, low atomic numbers, tubes, synchrotron radiation source can take care. Limitations by high matrix content, Matrix separation is required, restriction to flat or polished surface for depth profiling. But one main limitation of TXRF, 
which i could observe especially in developing country problem in alignment could you see that uh, in pxrf what happens that sample from x-ray beam comes it forms on multi-layer monochromator you have to align the monochromator and then it should go at the sample reflector at an angle less than the critical angle so these alignments for physicist it is easier but for users like chemist biologist archaeologist ctc they find it very difficult i have seen that there are so many phrf spectrometers which are not working especially in india because of these problem and the supplier they don't say about the alignment problem they so about electronics they solve the problem of the, this electrical problem but if you say that uh, alignment <laughs> just they raise their hand so this we as a pxrf community should handle this then again some common areas where future in future we can work analysis of low atomic number elements can lithium beryllium and boron be determined using indirect methods also like uh, improvement in input instrumentation sample chamber detector already lithium indirectly has been analyzed by xrf in water sample by precipitation as a free salt carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine are feasible but still more research improvements are needed to improve precision and accuracy fluorine is very important especially for the developing country it evaporates in acidic medium can we trap it in some membrane and determine our pyrohydrolyte sodium magnesium aluminum better conditions are required and here also that uh, improvement in precision and accuracy is required direct analysis of solids and liquids feasibility using solid as such slurry or dispersion can we do this can we determine species using lab sources probably ursula group they have that uh, lab based that uh, exops we can explore similar thing for lab based txrf a careful address of these problem and limitations can make txrf a very useful technique to the mankind and uh, even at present txrf provides several advantages features for trace element analysis in different areas of science and technology but it is a harsh reality that in terms of usage techniques like icpoes and icpms far surpass it one of the major reason is alignment problem difficult to get support i have told and we at txrf community must think for a mechanism providing study instruments developing countries this approach needs to be more intensive direct methods precision and accuracy needs to be improved let us think over it and how we can enforce txrf to develop it as a technique for preparation of most laboratories of the world and for the betterment of the life of the mankind then just i would like to say one sanskrit shloka where the it summarizes the aim of the txrf as sarve bhavant sukhana sarve sant niramaya sarve badrani pashyantu ma kashchid dukh bhagwa this means that may everyone be happy may everyone be healthy may everyone see the good things in their life and may no one suffer in life the xrf can con- contribute in this direction and i hope that uh, we at the xrf community will certainly do and one day this will come thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you so much, Nant, for the very nice presentation, the good wishes, and uh, the broad overview on the various you, applications. Thank you. And now it's time for questions. So, who wants to ask a question? So I have a question. I remember this uh, 
uh, talk about uh, the, the plutonium determination with TXRF, which I think is, is very impressive and it's a very, really a good application. So, so there TXRF is, is uh, kind of uh, using all its uh, capacities it has over ICPOES. And uh, you, you have these uh, film on top of the, um, of the um, plutonium yes, so sample. Um, that is collodion. Yeah, one, right. One liquid. Is, is, how what is that applied? That is, is, is... Just uh, first we drop the plutonium samples and dry it. And then we drop that collodion sample. Two microliter plutonium sample we drop, dry it. And then up, once it dries, then we drop collodion sample 10 microliter. It, it spreads on that. And after this... Five minutes it dry, makes a very thin film, which you cannot see. This mm -hmm. collodion is used for making this uh, X-ray diffraction samples. And we use this here for covering that one. So that if any loose contamination is there, it should not come out. It is a double care. And if plutonium is in a small amount, in non-dispersible form, then 1,000 becquerel, 1,000 becquerel can be handled in here. Ah, so just we really drop nice. it on the sample support and leave it. Yes. Do you by any chance know how thick this uh, collodium film is? How thick? That we have not measured, but it is very thin. A few microns will be there. We have not measured it, but, but it and we have checked that uh, this multi-element is standard without collodion film and with collodion film. The TXRF spectra, there is not much difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it it's, uh, must be really, really thin. Yes, it is. It is I, I think. So I, I can read from, from the chat. So there is a thank you note from Ashish Pandey. Thank you so much. Are there more questions? I, I think Christina has raised a hand, right? Right. Okay. Peter wants to make some comments. Uh, I, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. So we are sitting together. Now, Tandal, it was a very, very nice talk. This is really impressive what you put together. I just make a comment in particular on this light element business. Uh, you mentioned the sodium, magnesium, aluminium story, we are working long on that, and it is extremely uh, sensitive to the matrix. The matrix meaning what else element on the heavier side is present, and it is really taking careful preparation of the total mass of the sample, because even if we keep it as a thin film, the absorption effects are tremendously. So, here we must be very careful, but I really want to emphasize with a good preparation, we are able to quantify quite good. And uh, the other story uh, you mentioned, it is sometimes difficult to get support when you have a misaligned spectrometer. So it's sure for the physicist, it's easier because understanding all the, yes. what on the crystal and the multi-layer, and then you have to adjust the reflector of the sample to the beam positions you got. Uh, very interesting, uh, we made uh, together with Laura, Laura Borghese, uh, a remote session via Zoom, and we were in several steps in a position to guide her sitting in Brescia, we in Vienna, that the alignment was possible step by step. First multi-layer slits and beam, and then the same story with the fresh found position of the beam to the uh, system of the refractor. So, well, that's all. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Peter. But you, both of you, 
are very much <laughs> helpful in this type of work and this type of when whenever is required that i have seen but i was talking about other suppliers that once the instrument is there and uh, they can help in electronics they can help for the detector they can help for the electrical problem but alignment they don't know yeah. so for that one person has to learn it do it and then use it mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, most of the chemists biologists and uh, agriculturists they want that the uh, instrument should work i should use that was the story mm -hmm. yeah okay okay yeah thank you and are there more questions so maybe adding to um, the sorry uh, yes please Go yeah ahead. i have a short remark uh, regarding the alignment because uh, yeah <clears throat> i'm working for a supplier and uh, i have uh, to uh, say that at least with our bigger system with the t star we have already started to do something uh, here because uh, <clears throat> this system offers an automatic uh, alignment where you can start uh, simply press a button and then uh, the instrument uh, starts with a monochromator angle with a beam position and uh, with a <clears throat> sample angle and uh, the nicer thing is it's not a black box so if you're an expert then you actually see, can see every single measurement that the instrument is doing you can see the angle scan and the intensities so we are on the way to do this with a smaller system uh, it's still manual and uh, that there i agree can be tricky when you don't know what you are doing thank you thank you again and if this happens it is really helpful for the people who are using this thank you very much yeah are there more comments or questions so i i maybe have a question to the uranium oxide so um was uh, this aimed for nuclear forensics or what was the reason to uh, look at the uranium oxides it's this um... uranium oxide uh, just you see that when you are using it fuel it should be u2 u2 means uranium should be in poor oxidation state and this u3 it is also a very good oxide which find various application it is used as uranium standard for making uranium standard solutions okay and it is a fundamental study that to know the oxidation state of uranium and one more problem is there this uh, other techniques like xps and uh, they don't give good information about uranium this uh, oxidation state because energy gap is very very less this can be interpreted in any way so xap uh, sorry jens give good information about that but the sample preparation is tricky you see in jens you have to either make a pellet or you have to make a salary in that uh, or some organic some uh, solvent and then filter it on the filter paper dry it and then use as sample but this method of sample preparation is direct just you have to touch it there is now no much disturbance to your samples and the result which may come that will be maybe real so it was a fundamental come applied study mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you thank you so much okay i look at the list and the chat are there more questions i do not see any more questions then thank you so much again for your very thank nice you. presentation and um yes you all know this is the final um Tixer journal club and uh, eva was so kind to put some slides together about some statistics eva do you want yes. to share your slides can you see the presentation now or not i can see it in the powerpoint mode i can see i can see yeah and now for instance is is uh, changing the slide or not 
it's changing yes okay, okay. so everything is working yeah okay so yes. okay i i'm i uh, i start and then eva will um carry on so this is now mm -hmm. an overview about the teak surf journal club that ran from may 2021 to july 2023 so today actually our first uh, speaker was uh, uh, professor june kawai and also um, uh, the concluding uh, so one of the concluding talks today and um, so june and eva and me uh, uh, since i think now a year or so shared um, inviting people to give talks about uh, their research, uh, mostly somehow connected to TXRF. And Jasna from the beginning um, hosted all these talks on the Zoom platform so um, that we can meet as we meet today. And Ramon, he um, you may have not seen him, um, so he was more in the background, but he ran or he's running the YouTube web page of the Enforced TXREF and uh, part of this is the TXREF Journal Clubs and he takes care that all the recordings are posted on the um, YouTube channel. Yeah, so thank you so, to everyone who made all this possible. And why did we start meeting in the beginning? So this was due to the um, COVID-19 um, lockdown. So we were not able anymore to meet on conferences. Um, yeah, so I think Eva had this very nice picture where all these people are sitting together and uh, exchanging ideas and can drawing stuff on, on papers that was not possible anymore. But uh, thankfully, the digital world had evolved uh, quite a bit. And I think uh, we all now make good use of it. So I think there's some meetings that uh, are well done in a digital mode, but there's also, yeah, um, also many meetings which really profit from meeting in person and exchanging ideas in, in a closer Star, uh, way so to say yeah and uh, the idea what was pitched to me so the um so once because we had to postpone the txref conference i think but also um they were that was pitched by june carby actually um due to a journal club that Jerry Seidler had um, brought uh, in into being, so to say, uh, on for the Xanes and Exafs community. And I think which is also still running by uh, Jerry, organized by Jerry Seidler and uh, some colleagues. And uh, uh, that was uh, the reason that we then thought, OK, uh, we could um, do something similar for the TXREF community together with the EU cost action because uh, this action um, run by Laura, Laura Borghese mainly. So uh, thank you very much, Laura, um, that, that uh, you brought all of us together um, in, in this EU cost action. Um, where there exists uh, um, now, I think, a, a good emailing list, contact list to many, many, many people, not only in the EU, but also outside of the EU um, that um, are in some way involved into TXRF. Yeah, and uh, that is uh, how it started and it uh, now ran until today. So that is because the EU cost action is, is uh, coming to an end, unfortunately. Um, now I think in, in September this year, and also because now we have also um, more options in meetings uh, in, uh, in person again. Yeah, so, and now I will hand over to Eva who had put together some statistics. Yeah, okay. It's only a couple of slides to show you a brief summary of, of the talks. As you can see here, finally, we perform a total number of 17 talks during uh, this uh, period. As you can see in the slide, in, uh, the, in 2021, we started and we performed one, more or less one talk per month. 
but then uh, uh, in uh, 2022, I think that is because uh, the, pa the pandemic was more or less at the end, then <laughs> it was difficult also to find um, speakers each month. And then we performed the, the, the talks uh, in a, every two, three months or at, at the, as you can see in the table, even uh, four months. But uh, okay, uh, here uh, you can see also a little bit of uh, statistics about the countries, uh, the speakers countries, and uh, you can see there are a, a total uh, number of 10 uh, countries. And as you can see in the graph, the, <clears throat> the most participation is, uh, is uh, Japan. Then here is a little bit a summary of the topics of the talks. Uh, most part of them were focused on applications of TXRF. And as you can see here, uh, the one of the hot topics in uh, this field is now the aerosols and air, air particular matter uh, topic. Then we have also a couple of talks about uh, uh, um, environmental application regarding the analysis of soils and plants, and also one about uh, nan uh, nanomedicine. Uh, in addition to applications, there were also some uh, talks about instrumentation, other related techniques, uh, also about the quality of the results in TXRF analysis, including uh, some uh, standardization issues, and also a couple of talks about sample preparation in TXRF analysis. Here you can see a little bit the impact of these talks. Uh, extracted from the YouTube, uh, YouTube channel. Here we have a total number of views of uh, 1,368. And as you can see in the graph, uh, um, for, each, uh, for each talk, we have at least around 40 views. So I think that uh, it is a quite high impact, taking into account that, that our community is not very big. Okay, and now it's time to uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I want to, to acknowledge uh, all the uh, organizers, Ursula, June, also Jasna and Ramon for their uh, participation, and also Laura for the COST initiative. And also to all the speakers, because sometimes it's difficult or it's time to prepare a one hour talk. And I think that, uh, yeah. I want to, to acknowledge this effort. And of course, to all the participants that have joined us during uh, these couple of years. And now uh, it's time to meet in person. I think that a good opportunity will be next September in the TXRF conference that perhaps now Ursula can explain us a little bit more about this conference. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for for the nice uh, bridging. <clears throat> um, maybe I can share the web page of this the um conference. Let me see. I sorry, I need to. Okay, now. Okay, let's see. If I... Yes, <clears throat> that should be it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I think most of you are very well aware that uh, this uh, conference is coming up uh, in September. And the conference will run from the 5th to the 8th of September. And on the, on the 4th, so the Monday of that week, we will have the final meeting uh, from the EU COST initiative. And um, we are very lucky to um, have secured some sponsors. So thank you to, to our gold sponsors. This is uh, Bruca, Exilum, GNR, and Rigaku. And Bruca will also be the sponsor of uh, the welcome party that will be on Tuesday. You will also find the program on this uh, webpage. And we have. Um, a good number of invited speakers um, that you can look forward to. So I can scroll through them. I think um, you 
uh, we'll find some familiar names here and um, but maybe also some some new names um, and I think we can uh, really look forward to to the presentations of their scientific work and we will have also um, three contributions from the applications laboratory from the manufacturers uh, of TX ref instruments that will give us insights into their work. And um, when you scroll further down, you will find uh, the program. So first the overview of the program, I will not go into detail, so you can um, check um, the program out. And we will also, here we also have uh, the details, uh, including the titles of uh, the different presentations. Yeah, and then uh, so we will have also we will have uh, a social events, a welcome party on Tuesday. Then we have the excursion um, on Wednesday, I think. Let me see. It's here somewhere. And um, then we have the dinner on Thursday. And yeah, Friday will be a half day where we have a closing ceremony and then uh, there is uh, the end of the conference. The excursion will go to a um, yeah, historic mining site that is uh, close to Klausthal. And then Armin um, Gross from Bruca also uh, will, if the weather is fine, will organize uh, some hike to the highest uh, peak here in the Harz Mountains, and uh, but that will depend somehow on the weather. Yeah, so we will have uh, about 40 or contributions and also about 40 posters. And um, yeah, so I hope to see many of you on the conference. And um, if you would like to uh, submit a, a late poster that will still be possible. Also registration is still possible. And yes, I'm very much looking forward to meet all of you in person. Yeah, we will be there. Yeah, so <clears throat> are there any more questions, uh, comments? I don't see any, then thank you everyone again, the meeting here today. And I hope to see all of you then in September in Klausthal. A nice holidays to everybody. Yes, nice holiday thank to you. everyone. <laughs> I'm looking forward to all seeing you all in Klausthal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.